Well, our guest speaker this morning is also going to be speaking twice during the uh, Chafer Conference. Dr. Glazer, I first got to know uh, through his dissertation, which he wrote at uh, UCLA, right? Was that right? Or where? Fuller Center. Fuller, oh, you wrote at Fuller, okay. I get confused on these things. It was on the, um, it was on evangelism in the Jewish communities in Eastern Europe from 1890 to 1920, and uh, just amazing. So he's going to talk about that, but anybody who's ever written a doctoral dissertation knows that that is a topic you've done a deep dive in, and so it stays with you, and you continue to research it through the years. So he's going to be speaking on uh, Jewish evangelism uh, throughout this the period, 20th century, and up to the point of how, how uh, evangelism in the Jewish community since October 7th. And he was here, if you remember, back uh, on October the, October the 5th. I didn't know it until that last trip that actually we were in each other's presence about f almost 50 years ago now. He was in a group of singers. He worked with um, Jews for Jesus, and they had a singing group that went around and sung in churches uh, called the Wailing Wall. And they s would sing every year to a concert at uh, Spring Branch Community Church. I lived in a, some apartments next door to Spring Branch, and so I heard him then. But, of course, we didn't meet again until about six or seven years ago. So uh, Mitch has a, uh, has a great uh, uh, talent in music, but also in, in evangelism and in the Word, so he is going to come and teach this morning. So, Mitch? Uh, it's wonderful to be back. I'm really looking forward to the conference, and uh, a lot of the folks that will be at the conference are public speakers, and so they, they travel all over the place, and, and so none of us are often in the same place at the same time, and so I'm looking forward to the fellowship with some, some of my brothers and friends that I haven't seen in a while. So thank you for arranging the party for us, Robbie. I appreciate it. Uh, so we're going to be talking about Isaiah chapter 53. And it, it's, uh, I wrote a book called Isaiah 53 Explained, which will be for sale in the back. Don't forget that. Unless you fill out this little slip on, in here. I don't know where to, oh, you already ripped yours, Robbie. You just rip it off and hand it to whoever is back there, which might be me, and then you can take a free book. That's to get you to fill out the slip. Okay. And what I'm hoping is that you'll read the book, and then I'm hoping that you will give the book away to a Jewish friend, and then you'll come back and email me and say, Mitch, I need another book. That would make me feel really good. Uh, we've now, uh, well, we've seen over 200, maybe 250,000 of these books go out. And the royalties are great. I put my kids through school. And no, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> there are no royalties when you give things away for free. And, and so uh, we've had uh, a real emphasis. And uh, recently, that emphasis has been online. It's in 14 languages. And what's really neat about this is that we, we actually have this campaign running on Facebook. And we've done it every week for the last probably six years in Israel. And every time we try and come up with a more effective approach in Israel, it doesn't work as well as this one. And, I, and what's really funny is that a lot of the respondents are from the greater Tel Aviv area, which is the most secular area in Israel. And so we've just had a blast uh, being able to do this. In fact, you know, the nice thing about online stuff is you have numbers and everybody likes numbers. I like numbers. And so uh, between uh, July and now, we've actually given away close to 1,000 books. And what's interesting also is we asked, and by the way, it, it is in Hebrew, just so you know. <laughs> and so we, we asked a couple questions, which in, in marketing terms, you know, might be some resistance. But we, we, we need to know a few things if we're going to follow up effectively. So we not, try not to burden people, but we ask a few questions like, um, are you Jewish? Now, in Israel, usually that's the case. Uh, but what's really neat is we've had quite a few Muslims uh, get the book. And uh, so that, that really is wonderful. But so they say uh, yes. And then we ask a question, do you believe in Jesus? All of this, of course, is in Hebrew. 
do you believe in Jesus? Yes, no, not sure. It took me like 25 years and the last 25 years to figure out how to do that. And uh, instead of galvanizing them in their unbelief, which is mostly what people would be, give them an open door. 60% of them take it. And so we are following up on hundreds of unsaved Israelis who are ordering an Isaiah 53 book. And it's been wonderful. And yes, we've, we've, we just baptized the woman who, who, who read through it. We've, just, we've had a, a lot of real blessing on this. Now, once somebody said to me, Mitch, why did you write a book like that? Because, you know, you know, and I know, and maybe you know, that most Jews never read Isaiah 53. I mean, it's not number one on the hit parade. And, and we were just talking earlier, most Jewish people re read the Torah, the five books of Moses, even though the, the writings are in uh, the the book that you read in the synagogue. You have two books in the pew in the synagogue. You have the five books of Moses, then you have the rest of it. And, and so, and I was raised modern Orthodox, not very religious, but that's what I was raised. And I, I didn't, never accepted it until after I got saved, which confuses my rabbi, but that's okay. <laughs> so uh, it's interesting that Isaiah 53, though not read, people have a, they just have an interest in it. And uh, one of the people I was most surprised that had an interest in it, the Israelis are a little bit surprising, but this person amazed me, and that was my mother. So I became a believer in 1970 from a fairly decent Jewish home, and uh, not religious, but we practiced everything, of course. And I literally was, you know, just me and Barbara Streisand, I was born in Brooklyn, you know, but, <laughs> but I don't have a star for me in Prospect Park, which is the main park in Brooklyn. And so <clears throat> I was, but I was pretty typical like her. And so my mother was more typical. And her, my grandparents, my mom's grandparents were from, uh, from uh, Belarus, actually. And they came over to the U.S., actually the only ones in the family that made it if you can think about that. About 25 other relatives were all slaughtered by the Nazis. And so my grandparents, you know, they were, talk about being loyal to their Jewish identity in light of everything that happened. I mean, of course it was off the charts. And being a believer in Jesus for a Jewish person is seen as basic, basically ethnic suicide. You've put yourself outside the pale. And so uh, my mother was raised that way, and I was raised sort of that way, a little more diluted. And so I became a believer in Jesus, and I was, a, I think some of you heard my testimony before. It's, it's on video. You can see it. I found Shalom.com. Look up Mitch. And, uh, but what happened was I was, I was really a self-respecting, hardworking uh, hippie uh, in San Francisco. Don't ask me what I was how what I was working, but my daughter's attorney. I know I, I, I'm past the limit, so I know that. Okay, so I could talk about. It. But anyway, uh, this was the Jesus movement, and you know, one one it was like Jewish dominoes. Everybody was getting saved. All my hippie friends were getting saved. You know, and everybody was throwing away their drugs and throwing away their albums. You know, and just I would love to have some of those back, but but not the drugs. And, and so I got, I was just, you know, radically saved, transformed. And, uh, and I had long hair and everything else, you know, so I, so, but I knew that I had to tell my family that I'd become a believer. I knew that before I was a believer. I mean, that was one of the reasons I didn't want to become a believer, because I knew that if I did that, I'd have to tell my mother I'm, I'm a believer and my grandparents, oh my gosh, what a mess that would be. And so uh, I, I came to the Lord, went back to my parents' home in New Jersey at that time, and told my mom and dad the good news. Number one, I'm now a Christian, but I'm still Jewish. Trying, do you know what it's like to figure that out for a Jewish person? Okay. And so I, so I told them that. And then uh, I also told them uh, that they were going to hell. 
which they didn't appreciate, uh, and that Jesus could save them. So if they become turncoats and become Christians, they won't have to go to hell. Maybe not the best strategy. And then I told them that, and the good news was, because I was already, I was a college dropout by the time I was 17. And I said, I'm going back to college. I'm going to a Bible college where they study the Bible. And of course, my mom's first response is, what are you going to do for a living? Are you going to be a rabbi? I said, probably not exactly uh, the way you think about it. I was a missions major. And, and so that, that's how it started. So I asked my mom that night I got home before the next day happened when she had told me I need to leave the house. And I said, Mom, we've got one evening together. Can I just tell you what I believe? She said, no. I said, please, come on, one shot. She said, okay, okay, okay. But no New Testament and no crosses. You gotta understand Jewish mentality. I don't know, I still to this day don't know what she was thinking about the cross. So I said, okay. So I, I sat down and I was a believer now for about six, seven months, so I knew a lot. <laughs> and so I brought out the heavy artillery. I said, okay, mom, I'm gonna read you Isaiah 53. She says, what? I said, Isaiah 53. She says, I said, he's one of ours. It's okay. She said, all right. And, and so she was watching TV, reading the newspaper and listening to me speak, read. My mom was very good at that. And so I start reading and going through Isaiah 53 and like at verse seven, she fell asleep. It was at night. And I wake her up and I said, mom, how could you fall asleep? This is so important to me. And she, she said, look, it sounds like you're reading the New Testament. She was half asleep. It sounds like you're talking about Jesus. So I don't really want to hear about Jesus. So you had your shot. Don't ask me again. That went on for 40 years. You know, you got to give it time with a Jewish person. And uh, just so you know, at the end of her life, and it was, it was a sort of a deathbed conversion, but a little bit more than deathbed. And uh, we really believe my mom came to faith. At the end of her life, God gave her a, a Haitian Baptist Pentecostal, whatever, um, woman who was her home health care attendant for like six, seven months, and she shared the gospel with my mom all the time. So though I would like to take credit for it, um, no, you don't. And so she, she, really, she really did come to the Lord. But it was a long 40 years. She kept her word. She would never let me talk to her about it. But the Haitian Baptist woman didn't ask. I shouldn't have asked. So why could a Jewish woman who was raised religiously, who had so much at stake, how could she possibly respond to me and say, that sounds a lot like Jesus? Well, because it does, and it is. Now, here's the problem with most Jewish people, and it's one of the problems we have in Jewish evangelism. And then I'll maybe show you how it might be solved. So one of the big problems we have uh, is, number one, Jewish people don't read the New Testament. So how would they know anything about the life of Jesus to show that Isaiah 53 was fulfilled in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus if they don't believe that the New Testament's valid and they've never even read it? So where would they get the information from? Now, in, in New York, I understand it because during the Christmas season, believe it or not, we have Christmas carols playing all throughout the malls all over the Northeast. So I think Jewish people get all their New Testament understanding from malls. <laughs> so I, I, I really have no idea how, how, how it happens, but Jewish people get some, some understanding. But that's a real problem, isn't it? It's a problem. Because if Jewish people do not read or believe the New Testament, then how in the world can you convince them that the prophecy in Isaiah 53 points to Jesus? That's a problem, right? Second problem is this. 
Jewish people, although they should understand this, you have, to, you have to know that the temple in Jerusalem hasn't been standing for a long time. So 70 AD was about the last time. And now there are two mosques there who I'm sure Ravi has been to visit and tried to cause a riot, but it didn't happen. And you shouldn't have told that Muslim guy about Jesus, Ravi. And so the Jewish people do not believe in the necessity of blood atonement for salvation. I could quote Leviticus 17, 11, the life of the flesh is in the blood and I've given it upon your altar to make atonement for your souls. We can, many of us can quote it, but that doesn't mean that any Jewish person believes it. They don't see the temple. They've never seen the temple. Jewish people do not have any concept of a sacrifice of an animal for atonement of sin on the altar. Should they? Yes. But do they? No. Okay, so that's, that's a second big problem, even with Isaiah 53. The next problem is the whole Old Testament speaks against the sacrifice of human beings. Don't offer that kid to Moloch as much as they might deserve it. I mean, they don't, it, it's, it's so repugnant to the Jewish soul to think about God putting a human being to death. And so that's another problem also. See, I'm first talking you out of using Isaiah 53, then I'll talk you into it. Finally, as all, this, all of this is not enough, we understand that Jesus was a perfect sacrifice because he was sinless according to the law, correct? Because if he was not perfectly sinless, then he would have had to die for his own sin. And he couldn't have been a substitutionary atonement. So, the only way for Jesus to have been a perfect atonement is for Jesus to be God. That now means that a Jewish person, really, in order to come to sal salvific or sal to come to grips with Isaiah 53 in a way that gets them saved, then they would have to somehow conclude that God became human, lived a perfect life, died for our sin as a perfect substitutionary uh, sacrifice, and then, of course, rose from the dead. The rising from the dead is easier for a Jewish person to believe than any of the rest of it, <laughs> because we know a few in the Old Testament that rose from the dead. And so these are the stumbling blocks that a lot of Jewish people have. Now, how do I think that you should handle this if perchance you have a really wonderful relationship with a Jewish friend and they want to hear about Isaiah 53 from you? What do you do knowing all of these really difficult objections to overcome? Here's my suggestion. Ignore them. Answer them after they get saved. Believe me, it will be a lot easier. So just, just ignore them because the word of God is so powerful that it breaks down objections even when you are not carefully, analytically presenting the, uh, a, a good response to the objections. The Bible is what I call self-authenticating. You don't need to prove that the Bible's true. Hey, it's not bad to know a lot of the arguments from history, archaeology, or wherever they come, even philosophically. Apologetics is always good. But these objections are so ingrained in the souls of Jewish people that they are almost impossible to logically counter. And then there's my mom, who reads the text or listens to the text and says, that's about Jesus. <laughs> Don't read that again <laughs> to me. It can, and she was a smart lady. So it just jumped all the boundaries. Why? Because there's power in the Word of God. 
You know, the most wonderful thing about evangelism is you're not alone. He gave the Great Commission and he said, I'll be with you always. Okay, now you're an eschatologically interested church. I'll be with you always, even until the end of the age. So he will always be with us. And when we go out in fulfillment of the Great Commission to tell people about Jesus and to make disciples of all nations, he goes with us. So you're never alone in evangelism. God is always working before you and working after you. And the means by which God works so powerfully is through his word. So now, would you journey with me through Isaiah 53? <laughs> Robbie told me I had two hours, and I'm so thrilled about that <laughs> because I never get to preach a long, long time, and this is fun. Um, and you like studying the Bible, don't you? Oh, I'm going to have a great time. Okay, so uh, if you act, you can open your Bibles, but I'll have most of the texts on there. Uh, one of the most difficult um, issues to deal with in dealing with Isaiah 53 is trying to figure out where the prophecy begins. And there are a lot of different theories uh, about this, but I, I think it's, it's not just a sort of an academic uh, pro, uh, issue. Uh, it's also uh, very important, I think, for understanding the text. Uh, you do understand that there were no chapters and verses at the time that Isaiah wrote it. So, and if you also know, and probably you do, that when you go to a synagogue and they take out the scroll of Isaiah, or maybe you've been to the museum of the book and you've seen the Isaiah scroll that was basically the one from uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls. If you, if you look at the scrolls, there's actually no chapters and verses in the scrolls either. So how in the world does a Jewish person know where to begin and end? Well, there are markings on there that unless you know how to read the markings, you won't know what they are. And so this, there, are rhyme, there is rhyme and reason, you know, to some degree in terms of the chapters and verses. Some of them were based on the uh, markings, but a lot of them were not because a lot of the, a lot of the discoveries were, were later than the ninth century, because archaeology wasn't real big at that time. And so the, um, the standard version of the Hebrew Bible is called the Masoretic Text, which was developed by a group of rabbis and scribes called the Masoretes in about the ninth century uh, AD. And so a lot of the archaeological discoveries that we have now, for ex example, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, where we can see the markings, they're a little bit more mature and we understand them better. Um, they didn't have these. And so you have everything on a scroll and they did their best to do chapters and verse, verses. And sometimes they, they definitely did their worst instead of their best. And so where does Isaiah 53 uh, begin? Well, it certainly isn't in chapter 53. Uh, the traditional view is that Isaiah 53 begins with what we would call an executive summary in verses 13 through 15 of chapter 52. And that's that. But I'm going to suggest to you today, because this is such a great Bible teaching church, I figured I'd have to pull some trick out to get you interested and show you that I know more than your pastor, because that, that is going to be very hard. Okay, and he probably already knows this. So. so a lot of people would say that Isaiah 53 did not begin with the executive summary in 13 through 15 to 52, which we'll look at in a minute, but actually began in Isaiah 52, verse 7. And there are some markings on the Dead Sea Scroll version of Isaiah that some Israeli scholars say indicate that the passage uh, this, the servant's song begins there. So you know that this is one of the servant songs, correct? The servant's song, I mean, nowhere is it called the servant's song in the Old Testament. Actually, it was German theologians in the 20th, early 20th century that came up with the idea of servant songs, but it was a good idea. And 
their servant songs, songs that extol the virtues of the servant in the Old Testament, Isaiah 42, 49, 50, uh, and then uh, 52 through 53, for the most part. So let's look at this text just a little bit, because I think it would be a, a blessing. So if it starts here, then what I'm going to suggest is that what is happening in Isaiah 53, those 12 verses, are in a way embedded in verse 7 and will be re-embedded and expanded in verses 13 through 15 of chapter 52. So you all know the song. I won't ask you to sing it, although it's a wonderful song. But how lovely on the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who announces peace, and who brings good news of happiness, and who announces salvation and says to Zion, your God reigns. And so the hymn very well might be the servant because all of a sudden everything's going to be about the servant in Isaiah 52 through 53. So let's take a look. Are there hints as to who the servant might be? Uh, one of the uh, classic Jewish arguments against Jesus being the Messiah and why Isaiah 53 doesn't point to Jesus is because some people will say, some Jewish people will say, well, his name is not used. <laughs> That's a really bad argument. <laughs> okay. His name is never used. <laughs> There's no revelation of the Messiah's name in the Old Testament unless you're deep into Jewish mysticism. And even then, you don't have it. The uh, Jewish writings historically uh, talk about a, a lot of different kinds of names uh, for the Messiah, but his name is never used. So that's a bad argument. So how love, but what do we learn about the servant? So how lovely on the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news. It, what, what is the good news? So it's the Hebrew word basa, but it's only one word. It's not two words, but it is the good news. You know, Paul translates this in Greek in the New Testament with the Greek word evangelion, and that means gospel. And so the, the gospel is good news. So, but what is the good news? That's the question. So, well, let's look at what else is happening. Who announces peace? So he brings the good news and announces peace. So obviously, the good news is something about peace. So we know that peace is attached to the good news. And that's the Hebrew word, shalom. So we know that if you receive the good news, you might be finding peace. Secondly, the, bring, the bringing of the good news is the good news of happiness. So the good news gives you peace, and the good news makes you happy. And it's true. Uh, it's the Hebrew word tov. Tov means good. Can be mean, mean good news. It can also mean beautiful. Because the good news uh, is tov. It's beautiful. Am I kosher? Okay. So the good news is, again, uh, the center of attention here. The servant brings the good news, but it's the good news of happiness. So my grandmother's name in Yiddish, which was similar to the Hebrew, was Toby. And so my grandmother's name was good <laughs> or beautiful. And she was both. And so if you believe the good news that's being brought to you by whoever the hymn is, then you have peace and you are happy or beautiful. So if it's on the inside, you're happy. If it's on the outside, you're beautiful. Who announces salvation? All right, there we go. So not only if you receive this good news, not only do you have peace, not only do you have happiness, but you have salvation. Boy, that's getting really good now. So the word salvation 
um, is um, it's a beautiful, beautiful term, and has a lot of simil uh, uh, similes, uh, uh, deliverance, etc. So there's an announcement of salvation. Uh, you know, we're coming up on the Passover service, and so I'm writing a lot and speaking a lot about Passover already. Do you know that without the Passover, you'd never understand salvation in the Old Testament? Probably not in the New Testament. So s s salvation is founded on the Exodus, that the Jewish people were, were saved from the bondage of Egypt. And that became a basically the runner upon which the whole concept of salvation is developed all the way through the Old and New Testament. And isn't it wonderful that part of the salvation comes through the shed blood of a lamb? And so the whole idea of salvation and blood is already embedded in the Passover. It grows when we come to the sacrificial system and it is fulfilled when you come to Jesus. So uh, salvation, and say to Zion, and says to Zion, your God reigns. Malach is the word for king, so uh, we recognize that God is a king. So if you embrace the good news, then you'll probably discover that the good news, if you believe it, brings you peace, brings you happiness and beauty, brings salvation, which the Hebrew word technically means to make wide, so it gives you a way out. If you think of the end of a cave and you find it a wide, you know, when David was saying, Lord, save me, Lord, save me, and he was running from Saul in a, in, in a, in a cavern, he was, he, what he was saying, in a sense, was, I'm going to keep running, but please make, let there be a wide way out <laughs> at the back, back of it. So salvation means make wide. So salvation, and then your God reigns. It's a recognition that God is always on his throne, that God is always in control, and that he's always your sovereign. And so when you accept the good news, you're also accepting your own subservience to the God who is the king. So that's the good news. Now the passage actually uh, goes on, and I don't have it uh, in, in the PowerPoint, but there's one other uh, passage if you have your Bibles, as Isaiah continues, in verse 10 he says something that's profound about the good news also. Now, again, we don't know what the good news is yet, do we? It's just good news. So we don't, we don't know what it is. So verse 10, the Lord has bared his holy arm in the sight of all the nations, the goyim, that all the ends of the earth may see the salvation of our God. So embedded right here in Isaiah 53 is an expansion on Genesis 12:3, which said that through you all the families of the earth will be blessed. So in other words, God never forgets the nations in his plan, prophetic plan of redemption. It's always there. So whatever the good news is, it's not just the good news for the Jewish people, it's the good news for the nations. And I hope that's good news for you, if you happen to be non-Jewish. How many of you are not Jewish today? Okay, good, we're doing a good job with the Gentiles, Robbie. Okay, so God chose the Jewish people, maybe narrowed the focus a little bit, but he always remembered his promise to the Gentiles. And so the Lord has bared his holy arm. That's the saving uh, metaphor for this God's saving action in human history. In the sight of all the nations, that all the ends of the earth, ends of the earth is a technical Hebrew term that always refers to Gentiles. So that the ends of the earth may see the salvation of our God. And so now if I asked you to define the good news, because I want all this stuff. I want the happiness, I want the salvation, I want it to be assured of God's uh, lordship, and I want the salvation. Uh, would you tell me, could you tell me what the good news is based on this passage? Of course not. You don't know it yet. So now we come to the executive summary, chapter 52, 13. So the prophet continues 
and, and says, Behold, my servant will prosper. Okay, now we're directly introduced to the ebed, the servant. servant. Now, the Hebrew word ebed, E-V-E-D or E-B-E-D, the Hebrew word refers to a servant, but there's no difference in the, in the English makes a difference. The Hebrew makes no difference between a servant and a slave. Servant is a slave, a slave is a servant. Now, how did a Hebrew become a slave? Well, they could have been captured by the Assyrians, but then we never would have heard from them again. But how did a Hebrew become a slave? In general, a Hebrew became a slave when they lost the farm. And they had to indenture themselves to another Israelite who would take care of them and their family after seven years if they liked the guy. Then they put an earring in their ear and they would serve him in perpetuity. At the end of the 49th year, in the 50th year, would be a year of Jubilee. And in the year of Jubilee, all Hebrews who lost their land would get it back or their children would get it back. So for the most part, when you think of a servant or you think of a slave in the Old Testament, you're not thinking of someone who's subjugated to non-Jews. You're actually thinking of someone who's fully dependent upon a fellow Israelite for their livelihood and sustenance. And they have the opportunity to get out of the relationship if they manage it. But, you know, it's not like they can get a, a part-time job at Walmart or Starbucks with benefits. There, there's no night work for a slave. So how... Talk about perpetual poverty. How do you get out of it? It's not easy. And so, really, most of them had to wait for the 50th year if they lived that long. So a slave or a servant was poor. No doubt about it. Now we read, Behold, my servant will prosper. Okay, Isaiah, you are really confused. How in the world can a slave prosper? Well, that Hebrew word does not necessarily refer to having a lot of money. It can refer to the rever reversal of losses. So you could prosper in that. Uh, it's, it's, it's a fuller word than, than having to do with money. Uh, bank accounts were limited in the days of Isaiah, by the way. A lot of crypto, but not many bank accounts. And so the servant will prosper. In other words, the, the servant will get back what they lost. Well, when a Jewish person lost the farm, got indentured to another Israelite, they lost their seat at the gate. They couldn't dispense wisdom anymore. Uh, there, there was shame involved with it. You know, there was a lot of losses. And so this servant will get, pretty much, will get everything back that they lost that they probably would have gotten back in the 50th year, in the Jubilee year. So behold, my servant, and remember, this person hasn't been seen since Isaiah 49. So he's, he's kind of coming up out of the blue. My servant will prosper. Maybe there's a connection between the servant and the good news. Could be. I guess we'll find out. So my servant will prosper. So the one who should have been poor will actually no longer be poor. So in a sense, there are, in this very first bit of summary, there are two images of the servant. One, that he's poor and shamed and without an ability to care for his family. And the second version is that he's got everything he needs. And this is very interesting because when you're talking to your Jewish friend, even if they're a secular Jewish person, they know one thing for sure about whoever the Messiah will be, depending on what branch of Judaism they come from. They know for sure that whoever the Messiah is going to be, he's not going to be a suffering servant. Because we are taught that the Messiah, if you believe in a personal Messiah, which I was raised to believe because I was more traditional, but even most Jewish people, they get, they get confused. 
They might go to a reform synagogue where they're taught to believe in a messianic age, but they might forget that when they're talking about you and think that they should still believe in a personal Messiah. I'm telling you, the level of messianic knowledge within the Jewish community is pretty low. And they might have a, a more orthodox grandparent, but now they're raised reform, and they don't know whether or not to go with the grandparents' view, because that's sort of what they heard, or whether they go with the reform rabbi's view, which sometimes they're so philosophical that the average Jewish person doesn't know what they're talking about. And, and so you have, for sure, the view that when the Messiah comes, he will not be a suffering poor Messiah. It's the opposite. Opposite. So you're trying to sell your Jewish friend on a Messiah who would suffer and die. That's another objection. Not so easy. Uh, my wife tells a story. She's uh, Jewish, uh, born and raised in Argentina, and then came to Los Angeles when she was 10, and uh, was really, really poor. She was a poor Jewish girl. And she always asked her mom um, for two things, the way she tells it. She always wanted a bicycle and a puppy. And uh, I did get her the puppy eventually. But she wanted a bicycle and a puppy. And her mom's response, and I could, my mother-in-law um, was something else. She, she would have said this. She said, look, honey, we can't afford a bicycle. But when the Messiah comes, you'll get a bicycle. <laughs> it's, it's, an it's an interesting view of the Messianic hope. But that's, that's, that's really Jewish, let me tell you. It's kind of like when the Messiah comes, it will be Hanukkah. I would say it would be Christmas, but it will be. But the Jewish people probably aren't expecting that. So you have two images of the Messiah. Your Jewish friend is not expecting Isaiah to talk about a suffering Messiah. But what I do is I always love talking to a Jewish person, reading Isaiah 53. They sit over here. I sit over here. We're looking right at the text. And you may as well do it in English because most of your Jewish friends don't read Hebrew. So you're looking at the text and you ask questions. Well, so what does that say about the servant of the Lord? Well, it doesn't say Messiah. I said, okay, we don't have to say he's the Messiah yet, but what does it say? It says that he's poor. Okay, so if he's the Messiah, then for some reason he's poor rather than rich at this moment. And they said, huh, that's where the word of God has power. Trust the Bible. Don't worry about the objections. You'll never know enough to answer those objections because your Jewish friend will never know enough about the objections. <laughs> it's like talking to a Jehovah's Witness about, about John 1, 1 through 3 in Greek. They're not trained that way. Okay, so my servant will prosper. So you have two images of the Messiah from the get-go. On the one hand, the Messiah is poor. On the other side, the Messiah is rich. He will be high and lifted up and greatly exalted. Isaiah is very fond of this phrase because he uses it in Isaiah chapter 6 at his commissioning. He said, I saw the Lord. Remember this? High and lifted up and greatly exalted. And his train, his robe, filled the temple in this incredible vision uh, on Isaiah's part. So we now learn about a servant who is poor but will be restored to such a degree that he will be high, lifted up, and greatly exalted. And if Isaiah was here, I'm sure he'd say, now I know I use that, that terminology with, about God himself, but um, take it with a grain of salt right now. There's more information. Could be that the Lord himself is building the case. So, do I think Isaiah is directly describing the servant as God in the flesh? Maybe. Can't wait to ask him. 
But I know that he's using the same language about the servant that he used about God. So what do you think? Now, what your Jewish friend's going to say, where is that? <laughs> in, in chapter 6, how do you get there? So you, show, you go to chapter 6 and show it to him. So he be high and lifted up and greatly exalted. Just as many were astonished at you, my people, so his appearance was marred more than any man and his form more than the sons of men. This is incredibly mysterious. So just as many were stunned by the way God handled the Jewish people, because the Jewish people were the chosen nation, created nation, the objects of God's magnificent covenant love, and yet God allowed them to suffer. God allows people he loves to suffer. He does. And it's an astonishing thing. Isaiah says. So this person's appearance, even though he's a servant of God, God is going to allow him to be marred, just translate it this way, scarred. Marred, really in the Hebrew, is scarred. It could actually be disfigured, which is exactly what happened with the whipping and the cross. So his appearance was marred more than any man and his form more than the sons of man. And then verse 15 is amazing. Thus he will sprinkle many nations. Now, what, you know, can you imagine? First of all, Isaiah didn't even have a hose, you know? So what was he talking about? He will sprinkle many nations. Well, sometimes the prophets borrowed words from other parts of the Bible. This word is borrowed from Leviticus 1 through 7, where the sprinkling was all about the sprinkling of blood, not water. It's the same Hebrew word that floats all the way through Leviticus 1 through 7 in reference to what you do with the sacrificial blood. And all he is saying here, Isaiah, thus... This marred and scarred servant, this one who would be high and lifted up and greatly exalted, this person will actually sprinkle in some way atoning blood upon the nations, the Gentiles. Wow. Your Jewish friend won't know what to do with that. But you give it to him anyway. Thus he will sprinkle many nations. And then... Kings, now listen, there's a little important thing embedded here too. That's a plural there, kings. The Jew, Israel only had a king. So if it was the Jewish people he was referring to, Jewish kings, he wouldn't have said kings. It was a, it's another reference to the Gentiles. Kings, the kings of the Gentiles will shut their mouths on account of him, for what they had been told them, they will see. What they had not heard, they will understand. And so, there's a promise that whatever the servant does for his own people, he's doing also for the Gentiles and even some of the great kings of the earth in seeing this happen will respond and believe. Very hopeful, isn't it? Okay, now we can look at Isaiah 53. So, we now learned about the good news. Still don't know what it is. But we're getting a hint here that it may not be a philosophy. The good news actually might be a person. What do you think of that? Might be the servant. So the servant will be high and lifted up and greatly exalted after being born into poverty and somehow managing to gain wealth. He'll be marred and scarred. He'll sprinkle atoning blood upon the Gentiles. My gosh, what a story, Isaiah. And I think Isaiah could say in the midst or after this story, 
So who's believed our message? In other words, who would believe this stuff? This is so impossible. Who would believe it? So let me ask you, because I know what I want to respond to this one. Who has believed our message? I raised my hand. I believe it. I hope you believe it. And to whom has the saving actions of God invading human history been revealed? For those of you who are Passover savvy, just so you know, the Hebrew word for arm is Zeroah, which is the lamb's, name of the lamb's bone on this Passover plate. And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He could have left, left us in the dark. And now we come to probably what's more familiar to everybody. For he grew up before us like a tender shoot, a root out of parched ground, he has no stately form or majesty that we should look upon him, nor appearance that we should be attracted to him. There was nothing about his charisma. There was not a charismatic personality. It wasn't that he was so good looking. It wasn't that he was a great orator. There was nothing about him except something from the inside seemed to radiate out from this person. No stately form or majesty, nor appearance that we should be attracted to him, in other words, but we were, but we will be. In fact, it gets worse. He was despised and forsaken of men, a man acquainted, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And like one from whom men hide their eyes. You remember who men hide their eyes from? They hide their eyes and get away from, from people who might have leprosy. Do you know that one of the names for the Messiah in rabbinic liter literature, even though Jews are not supposed to believe in a suffering Messiah, right? But one of the names historically for the Messiah in the Talmud, which is a word you probably have heard of, is the leprous one. Comes right from Isaiah 53. So let's just say the idea of a suffering Messiah actually existed probably before the time of Christ but it was a minority report. But it was there, and still is there. A man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, like one who, basically, that men hid, uh, treated like a leper. He was despised, and we didn't esteem him. So whoever this servant is, is one that we were rejecting. And then the rejection gets even harsher. Surely our griefs he himself bore and our sorrows he carried. Whoa, that's, let's go back. Okay. He was despised and forsaken. A man of sorrows acquainted with grief. He was despised and we didn't esteem him. So, What did he carry and for whom? Surely our griefs he himself bar, bore and our sorrows he carried. So if he was sorrowful, he wasn't sorrowful for himself. He was sorrowful for someone else. And the Jewish people at this moment, there's some kind of spiritual breakthrough that will happen. And I do think it will happen. I don't have time to talk about Zechariah 12, 10 or Romans chapter 11, verses 25 and following, when the entirety of the nation of Israel turns to Jesus as Messiah. That is a promise that will happen. Some people see, think that at that moment, and it preaches so beautifully, but it may or may not be true, but who cares? No. At that point, maybe the chorus that Israel will sing will be Isaiah 53. I can tell you this much, I've sung it already. Because as a Jewish person, I thought, really, not much of Jesus, but it seemed to me that he carried his own stuff. And now, all of a sudden, something's happened to the Jewish soul. And the Jewish people are saying, no, 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 no. He didn't carry his own stuff. He carried ours. He carried ours. So this whole idea of substitutionary atonement, one person bearing the sins of another, one person suffering on behalf of another, this is not something foreign. It's not created in the New Testament. This is an Isaiah concept. 
and more. So now we've changed our whole mind about Jesus. We, we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted, but we now recognize he was pierced through for our transgressions, the Hebrew word for rebellion. He was crushed for our iniquities, the Hebrew word for being crooked. Against the straight line of the law, he, he was crooked. Well, he wasn't crooked in his actions or thoughts. He was crooked because we were crooked. So he was crushed, not for his iniquities, but for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being, that's shalom, that's the Hebrew word there, fell upon him. So all that he experienced by being whipped, by being crucified, by enduring the rejection, all that he endured, he endured for us. We deserved it. He received it. And by his scourging, we are healed. And then there's an incredible self-recognition that there's not a person in the world who can get saved without recognizing verse 6. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. Wow, it's beautiful, isn't it? Wow. Wow. So actually, everything he suffered, he suffered for those of us who didn't deserve for him to suffer on our behalf. We we're unworthy. Why would he have done that? He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he didn't open his mouth. Peter picks up on that and says that's the way we should behave when we are wronged. We should be like Jesus. Jesus. Like a lamb that's led to the slaughter. There's the Passover language again. Brings an image of the lamb led to the slaughter. Not just the sacrificial system, but the Passover lamb, which was slaughtered in the tenth plague. And like a sheep silent before a cheer, so he didn't open his mouth. Again, he didn't complain when he was suffering, when he knew he wasn't suffering for himself. He was suffering because of us. What love. What, what amazing love. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that? And here it is. He was cut off out of the land from, of the living, a Hebrew idiomatic expression that's always used for death. He was cut off out of the land of the living, for the transgression of my people to whom the stroke was due. I was having a uh, sort of a, a very uh, vivid discussion, an, an active discussion with a Hasidic rabbi. I was at Brooklyn College, and when I'm not speaking, you know, I, I, I am a missionary too. So I was at Brooklyn College, which has a lot of Jewish people, and I was set up a book table, and next to me, uh, this other, this rabbi who was part of the Chabad movement, Lubavitch movement, if you know it, it was a, a very interesting, mystical, evangelistic kind of uh, Hasidic movement. And so, instead of talking to students at Brooklyn College, we were talking to each other all day. So we did a lousy job talking to students. And we had a, he was a very nice guy. And so we had a lot of dialogue. Once in a while, you know, he got frustrated, I got frustrated, and we, 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 we were loud. And the kids were walking by saying, why, is that, why are they yelling at each other? You know, we weren't yelling, we were passionate. And, and, and so uh, we were going back and forth, back and forth. And uh, finally, it was actually a Friday, and so we both had to leave quickly because he had to get back for Shabbat, I had to get back for Shabbat, and uh, we were on our way back to our cars, and we were still going, still going, you know. I mean, we covered everything. You know, I won't, I, one day I'll fill you in on our discussion on the Trinity. That was the best. But we're going back and forth. And then finally, I think I got frustrated. And I said, look, if you can, if you can tell me who Isaiah's people are, then I will just give up my, my faith and you can convert me back to Judaism, which is what he's trying to do. He says, what do you mean, who's Isaiah's people? I, I, yeah, it's, it's in Isaiah chapter 53. 
He says, oh, that, you know, the, that again. You know. I said, yeah, look at it. We both had Bibles. And I said, what does it say? It says that he was cut off out of the, it says the same thing as the English, you know. And he was cut off for the transgression of my people. So, who were Isaiah's people? The Jewish people. I said, well, you told me earlier that the Jewish people were persecuted and punished on behalf of the sins of the Gentiles, which is the usual Jewish interpretation. I said, so what will it be? Who's Isaiah's people? Because if it's the Jewish people, then the Jewish people were actually suffering for the sins of themselves. <laughs> he says, hmm, let me look at this. I said, look, it was the servant. It was what I believe. It was Yeshua. He was the one who suffered and was cut off out of the land of the living. And besides, Rabbi, if the Jews were all killed, why are we talking to each other? <laughs> so your interpretation doesn't work for me. He says, I'll take it under advisement. And then he died. His grave was assigned with wicked men, with a rich man in his death. Joseph of Arimathea gave him his tomb. Because he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. Again, it, Peter picks up on all of this as a pastor, and he tells us how to suffer. Suffer innocently, don't complain, and recognize that uh, even if you're suffering because of the way someone else is treating you, there is a strong possibility you did something to deserve it. <laughs> but in this instance, clearly we're told he didn't deserve it. He didn't deserve it. Please don't uh, you think that God was actually happy. I know the word pleased is used there, but it's, 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 it was God's will. That's really how it should be translated. I don't know why people put pleased. To crush him, putting him to grief. So he died. He died a real death. He was, it was an undeserving death. And then Isaiah finishes it up. If he would render himself as a guilt offering, he will see his zerah, which is the Hebrew word for seed or offspring. He will see his offspring. He will prolong his days and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. There's only one problem here, and that is he died. Didn't he die? How many of you think he died? Okay. How many of you think he's still alive? Oh, you're all confused. Okay. <laughs> but he did die a real death, right? He will see his offspring. He will prolong his days and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper. Don't let your Jewish friend off easy on this one. Just say, okay, if this servant of the Lord died, then how does he have children? Or how does he have grandchildren? And how does God prolong his days if he's dead? Your poor Jewish friend is going to sit there by this point, if they're hanging in with you and say, I don't know, I'll ask my rabbi. <laughs> you know, I mean, there's, there's no answer for it. Except that he died, he crushed death, he rose from the grave, and he lives forever. And as a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied. Uh, this is a translation issue. By his knowledge, the righteous one, it could be understood as by the knowledge of him. By knowledge of him, the righteous one, my servant, many will be justified. It could be read that way. But either way, it works. So by his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, will justify the many, and he will bear their iniquity. So we've come full circle, haven't we? Where it was easy for the Jewish people to think that he was the one that deserved every, all the judgment and the punishment. But yet God opened the hearts of the Jewish people and they recognize that and will recognize and some of us have recognized that actually he suffered for us.
He did what we could never do for ourselves. He atoned for our sins. Now, how un-Jewish is this? Well, I'll throw this in, no extra money. I've got four minutes. So, uh, every Rosh Hashanah, every New Year, the Jewish people read Genesis chapter 22 in the synagogue. And we read Genesis 22, which is called the Akedah, it's the Hebrew word for binding. And it is the binding of Isaac. God told Abraham to take his one and only beloved son, take him up to Mount Moriah, of course, where the cross would one day stand and the temple would one day stand. Take him up to Mount Moriah and, and kill him. And Abraham kept, kept saying the same Hebrew word that Isaiah used in Isaiah 6, which is hineni, hineni, here am I, here am I, I'm available, I'll do whatever you want. Abraham was impetuous. He kept saying, yes, here I am, before he knew what he was supposed to do. And so he stuck to his obedience. He got to the top of the mountain, and the angel stopped him from plunging the knife into the heart of his only beloved son that was bound on the altar. And Abram saw that there was a ram caught in the thicket and got that ram and killed, led Isaac off, killed the ram, and poured out its blood and made a sacrifice. The ram died in the place of Isaac. It was the first substitutionary atonement on Mount Moriah where the temple would be built and where ultimately Jesus would die in that same mountain range. And so there is a substitutionary atonement. His life for our life. Jewish people know that. So there is an idea of substitutionary atonement. I'll give you one more. Right before uh, the Day of Atonement. So you have Rosh Hashanah uh, on the first of the month, Yom Kippur on the tenth of the month. As you're approaching the tenth of the month, this is a weird Jewish tradition, but it's done all the time. My grandparents did it. It's, I live ten blocks from the headquarters of the Chabad Hasidic group, and so I see this every year. They truck in thousands and thousands of chickens. And the reason they do that is because there's a ritual. It's actually called Kippuras, which means atonement. It's actually the word, Yom Kippur, Kippur. And so they cut off the head of the chicken, swing it around the head, their heads, and say, he goes to death and I go to life. You tell me the Jewish people don't still have some understanding of substitutionary atonement by the shedding of blood? When we talk to Jewish people about that, we call that a redemptive analogy. It's a highfalutin mission term, which means that we take something from another culture and we show how it parallels what God said would happen in the Word of God. We teach through another person's culture. But there's no doubt in my mind, and how, so how could a person like me believe in Jesus with my background? Because the Bible says it's true. And you can't miss it if you're looking for it. Again, I'll allot him a portion with the great. He'll divide the booty with the strong. He lives. He doesn't die. Why? Because he poured out himself to death. He was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he himself bore the sin of many. What a magnificent passage. Want to read Paul's commentary on Isaiah 53? I'm sure this is it. Paul writes, we're ambassadors for Christ as through God we're entreating, we're entreating through us. We beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. He made him who knew no sin to be sin, that we might become the righteousness of of God in him. Everything that we deserved, he received. And everything that he deserved, we received. Some people could say, that's unfair. But actually, the Bible has a word for it. It's grace. It's grace. 
Isaiah 53 is one of the most beautiful pictures of God's grace to both Jews and Gentiles through the one who is the good news. It's not a, not a philosophy, dear friends. It's a person. And the person is Jesus. Let's pray. Uh, Lord, thank you for the opportunity to take this brief journey through your word. Thank you, Lord, for the amazing picture, the portrait of your son, our beloved Messiah, Jesus. And Lord, just reading through this and looking at the text again, Lord, we just love him so much more this morning because we're reminded of what he and what you did for us. You could have left us as wandering sinners in a dark world, but you sent your only son, the light of the world, to save us and to lead us into life eternal. And now, Lord, we pray for our Jewish friends and neighbors. We pray, Lord, especially in light of October 7th and all the pain Jewish people are going through. We pray, Lord, that you might use us and others to bring the message of Isaiah 53 to your chosen people, that they might believe and discover the good news. And we pray in his name. Amen.